evening, good evening, good evening. And welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study as we are ready to delve in for this evening, see how the Lord will lead us. Um, prayerfully, everybody has uh, remained safe and made it through the storm that passed through. Enjoyed the summer-like day of today. Tawana, good to see you. Shay, uh, good to see you tonight. Um, yeah, it, it uh, hmm, kind of came through like a, a quick rushing storm and knocked out the power and everything then popped back on. So we, we're good. Um, yeah, Brother McClure, good to see you. Velma, everybody, good to see everybody logging on this evening uh, for our Bible study. And uh, yeah, God's just been very, very good to us. So I'm, I'm hoping everybody enjoyed the day as much as they could. And uh, still yet more day to go. This is my great time of year when uh, we get this extended day. And of course, by the time we get into the summer, it'll be even longer. But I love it. I love it when it's daylight until 8, 9 o'clock at night. Absolutely love it. So this evening uh, for our Bible study, we're going to be in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3. This is actually the final chapter of 2 Peter. A uh, much shorter letter, uh, but no less profound as Peter deals with the uh, the false teachers. In fact, our uh, three-word summary for 2 Peter is the to purge false teachers, purge false teachers. Uh, so we'll get into that here in just a moment. We're going to pray and get everybody started. So again, 2 Peter chapter 3 is where we'll begin uh, for this evening. Uh, good to see everybody coming on. Andre, Winfred, Tawana. All right. Good to see everybody this evening. Uh, so 2 Peter chapter 3, final chapter of 2 Peter. Uh, so let's pray and get going for this evening. Eternal God, we thank you for another great and glorious day you've allowed us to see. Thank you for your hedge of protection. God, for even in the midst of all that has transpired today, you've been keeping us and watching over us, and we thank you for that. So we pray, God, that even now, that as we open up your word uh, in the scripture and that we share through these uh, platforms of, of uh, live streaming and uh, that those who are being reached, God, will be blessed by the study of the word tonight, uh, that their uh, eyes might be open and illuminated uh, to the words of your, of your scripture, and that we might grow thereby, not just to be more knowledgeable of you, but that we might live better for you. And so, God, I just pray that your word will be rich and fruitful into each and every life, and that we would apply it to our lives, and that we would share it with others so that they might grow and learn as well. So, Father, for those that are on uh, on tonight, uh, viewing via live stream, and those who will tune in later, we pray your blessing and favor upon, and just guide our time. We want to have an enjoyable time in you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, so um, we are again in 2 Peter chapter 3 as we continue to progress through this um, second letter or second epistle. Uh, an epistle is just another term for a letter. Uh, of uh, Peter, and re as we can do a little bit of reflection, um, this second letter of Peter uh, has as a three-word summary, purge false teachers, purge false teachers. Um, chapter one, as we went through it, uh, dealt with the cultivation of Christian character. Chapter two was the condemnation of false teachers, and this final chapter, chapter three, is the confidence of Christ's return. All right, so those, that's the, the chapter division breakdown. So you're going to hear that later. Hello, you're going to hear that later, um, you know, to, to be able to break out that chapter division. So you had the cultivation of Christian character, the condemnation of false teachers in chapter two, and then the confidence of Christ's return in chapter three. So those are three chapters, and that's how the, the outline of the book is laid out. That is an outline that we've used for it, okay? So purging false teachers and looking at that. So as we kind of finished off on last week, he dealt with this purging of false teachers, and uh, Peter spoke very strongly of them uh, and, and the negativity they, that they posed uh, to Christians in terms of just perverting what Christians we as Christians have uh, and then kind of close out the whole idea of their uh, falseness and, and, and identifying them as those who, like dogs, would return to their own vomit. Um, kind of a very gr gross uh, uh, analogy that he used. Uh, but again, letting you know the vileness of these who were false in their teachings. And so uh, this particular week, as we pick up in chapter 3 uh, of Second Peter, we want to look at the confidence of Christ's return because in the midst of all of the stuff that's going on, in the midst of all these false teachings, in the midst of all of the challenges, um, one of the areas that false teachers were obviously 
uh, challenging Christians on is when is Christ going to return? I mean, you, you know, you, you guys are holding on to this Christianity and you're holding on to this faith, but it doesn't look like Christ is ever coming back. And uh, you got to keep it in the sense of mind that as they are uh, speaking of the return of Christ, they're looking at Old Testament scriptures that are have also prophesied of his return after he had died, that he would come back. And so they're looking at it kind of close and they're thinking, well, he should have come back. You know, because again, we, we're always thinking things should happen quick, fast, and in a hurry. Guess what? 2021 wasn't the first time that people began thinking that we should be able to uh, have things in a microwave way. So even then, they're thinking it should have happened by now. And they're challenging the whole strength of the doctrine of Christianity of, on the grounds of the fact that Christ hadn't returned. And of course, now here we are 2,000 years removed and people are challenging it in that venue even the more. It's been 2,000 years. Where's Christ? Is he ever coming back? He doesn't, you know, and then people are saying, well, he's probably never coming, so we can go ahead and do what we want to do. And then there are others that are saying, well, that's, it's, a, it's not even a true teaching because he hasn't come back. He said he was coming back and he hasn't kept his word. So that's kind of the, 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 the impetus where we kind of move into chapter three uh, with these false teachers. And so Peter says, beloved, I now write to you this second epistle or letter um, in both of which... I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. What Peter says, look, I'm writing to you this second letter so I can stir up, and the way he uses this terminology, uh, stir up your pure minds. What he's literally saying is I, I want to stir up that which is true, that which is of Christ. I want to stir up your Christ-like mindedness. I want to stir up your Christ-like memory. I want to stir up in you what was deposited in you as truth from above, okay? And so I'm, I'm reaching in to stir up that spiritual truth and that reality that is pure in you that has not been perverted and cannot be perverted. I want to stir that mind up in you by way of reminder, okay? Uh, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this, first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking about to their own lusts. So, first of all, he says, hey, reminder, scripture already told us, even the Old, Old Testament prophets told us, before even Christ came on the scene, they told us scoffers were going to come. False teachers were going to come. Naysayers would come. So remember, you got that warning that's already out there. So you've got, they're going to come, and I want to stir up your memory that they're going to come. You know, sometimes we go along, even in today, and we think, you know, everything is, is going to be black and white, and there's going to be nobody to challenge truth. Keep this in mind, even today, naysayers are going to come. Scoffers are going to come. False teachers are going to come. They're going to do that to detract and distract from what God has said. So as by way of reminder, let that be in your heart. Let that be in your spirit. And they're going to be walking according to their own lusts. In other words, they're going to be coming up with theories based on their own intellect. Contrary to what God said, they'll come up with their own view, their own opinion, their own decision. Some of you probably have heard and known some folk that came along and said, hey, the, world, the world's coming to an end on this date, this time. And people got all up in an uproar and scared and stuff about it, and it didn't happen. Well, that was, that's the whole idea of scoffers who came up with theories according to their own lusts, according to their own flesh, according to their own mindset, according to what they wanted to, to happen. But guess what? God does not respond to what man wants to happen as it relates to the plan he already has. Okay? If God already has a plan when he's going to return, it's not going to change because man says... God needs to return. If I don't, if I don't get this three million dollars for my jet, then God's going to return. God doesn't. God, God does not respond to to act to foolishness like that. God's going to act on when He has set things in motion to happen. And so, the scoffers will come along and they'll throw out all this kinds of stuff. And this is a warning. This is the way He says, "I'm going to stir you up." So they're going to they're going to act on their own lust and saying, "Where is the promise of His coming?" Okay, here it is. What? He said he was coming back. Well, where is he? Where is the fulfillment of the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So they're saying, well, nothing's really changed. Ever since all the way back through the Old Testament prophets, things are still the same. And where is this Christ that said he was going to come back and he was going to return? Where is this, 
this whole uh, prophetic ministry is all false. It's basically what the false teachers are, are challenging. There's a problem with it. It's not, it hasn't happened. Nothing's changed. You know, Christ came, he lived, he died, he, he was buried in a tomb, rose again the third day. But other than that, nothing's changed. They're saying basically everything's still the same. So when is Christ going to return? What, what's, they're challenging the truth of Christianity. Had a conversation the other day where it's kind of similar, challenging the truth of God. And my, my argument is always this. If you're going to challenge the truth of God, what is your basis that you're going to challenge it on? Okay, what are you standing on to challenge the truth? Okay, and so that's what, in essence, Peter is saying, hey, they're, they're going to raise all this stuff up. And they said, you know, since, since our fathers, just, the previous generations have fallen asleep, everything continues as it was from the beginning. They say even all the way back to the beginning of creation. Every, every since man sinned, everything goes all the way back to there. For this, they will willfully forget. For this, they willfully forget. They, they forget this part intentionally, okay? He says, they will forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. So what he says, they forget that, look, the world that came out of water, in other words, in, in the whole creation order of God, that whole, he uses this whole water thing, that came out of water and existed with water was destroyed by water. They forget about how God can work things out, how God can, can miraculously do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. Watch this. But the whole thing is, it happened as a result of the sin of man, okay? While man was sinning and his sin had risen up to God, God eventually says, okay, enough is enough. It's time. Even though sin was going on, going on, and it looked like nothing was going to happen, then God finally says, okay, enough is enough. And he destroyed the world, as we knew it, that came out of the water, by water, and that is by the floods, okay? And so even though the world came up out of it and came, you know, had water on it, it was actually destroyed by it, but it was destroyed by water in the timing of God. That's what's key. That's what's critical. The type that God's judgment came on mankind when God got ready for it to happen. Okay? And that's what Peter's argument is here. By which the world, I'm sorry, verse 6, I think it is, um, by, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of, an, of ungodly men. Watch this. That same earth that came out of the water, that was formed through the water and had water on it, and that was, just, that was literally, and the earth actually wasn't destroyed, but mankind was destroyed by that flooding of the water. In essence, what he says, what God has done, he has, he's reserved the earth for the day of judgment. In other words, he's kind of put the earth judgment on layaway until he gets ready to pay to cause it to pay the debt okay so in other words sin's debt is going to be paid it may not be paid when you want it to it may not be paid when these scoffers and these false teachers say it should be but it will be paid the example is it was it, the, the price of sin was paid for in the flood and he says right now god has uh kind of preserved the day he's preserved this earth for that day that he decides to bring judgment and perdition for the ungodly men and the sinfulness of the world. So it's going to happen. So I just want to remind people who, who are going around thinking, hey, you know, nothing's going to happen. We can do whatever we want. We can live however we want. No, judgment is coming. God has a day of judgment and he's preserved that, that day. Now, we don't know when it will be, but trust and be as rest assured, it will come about, okay? But beloved, do not forget this one thing. That with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The whole idea here, some people kind of read all into this and they try to calculate days and they say one year is a thousand days and this and all. But the, the real idea here is not that he's giving some literal transliteration of days and time with God. What he's literally saying here is he's, he's using kind of a simile and he's saying, look, to God, time is different than it is to man, you know? Whereas for man, it might be a thousand years, but to God, it feels like a day, okay? So in essence, since Christ has 
risen from the dead, in our sense, it's been two days, okay? So it was just two days ago that he said, I'm coming back. So we might be thinking, well, when is he coming back? When is he coming back? And if, if you literally use the thousand years, it's just two days, okay? Thousand years is like a day. It's been 2,000 years, so it's been two days. But literally what he's saying is, it's not that it's 1,000 years is a day or that it's actually only been two days. He's saying God doesn't count time like we count time, okay? God has given time to us, but he lives outside of time. He's not constricted by time. And so time is not relevant. It doesn't have the same relevance to God as it does to us, okay? So that's literally what he's saying here in verse 8. He says, so the Lord is not slack concerning his promises or his promise as some count slackness. In other words, God's not going to say something that he ain't going to bring to pass, okay? He's not like, you know, your friend Bubba that said, hey, I promised, man, I'm going bring back your tools, and he never bring them back. Or you, you'll find, like this weekend, you know, family members say, oh, yeah, I'm coming to the cookout, and I'm going to bring ABC, and they never show up, okay? God is not, he's not slack in, in terms of his promises. What he says he's going to do, he's going to do, Okay? And so the fact that he hasn't done it in the timing that the naysayers and the false teachers and those who think that he should have done it by now, that does not mean God is not going to do it because God is not like man, okay? Um, so he's not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but he is long suffering, okay? Towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Watch this. In other, in other, what Peter is literally telling, uh, telling us here, the argument that he's making as he, as he writes this letter is, watch this, one, God doesn't count time like us, and time is irrelevant to God, but two, God's patient. He's patient in the sin and the wretchedness of man so that more can come to salvation. God is patient with us. Aren't you glad about that? I mean, you know, I know sometimes you might think, you know what? Hey, I'm saved. I'm born again. Why don't the Lord come back today? We might look at all the stuff that's going on in the world, all these mass shootings, all this corruption, all this coronavirus stuff, all this stuff going on. We're like, Lord, why don't you come back today? But if he came back today, how many people would not get an opportunity to be saved? And yeah, it's all wickedness and all destruction and all, you know, craziness going on. But God, he says here, God is patient and long suffering. So he will allow things to go on way longer than we think they probably should. But he's being patiently waiting because his desire is that no one would perish. Now, it's not saying that he, he fixed it that no one would perish. He already knows some will, but he's giving opportunity that more would come and more would have opportunity to accept. It is, in essence, a picture of the grace of God, that God is gracious. Guess what? Let's say you got saved in 1979. Well, the people who were back in 1929 or maybe even 1969, they might have been saying the same thing, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And what if God had come when they wanted him to come? Then you would have never got a chance to get saved. So literally, God is patient, and he's allowing opportunity for more to come in. He's not willing. He's not desirous. He's he hoping I mean, he's, 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 he's made provisions that none would perish, but that they, they would all come to repentance. So he's patient. And so another justification for the fact that he has not returned is his patience. He's patient with man. I'm glad he's patient with man because he could have wiped me out before I got saved. Amen, somebody. He could have wiped you out before you came to Christ. And hey, some of us were greatly deserving because of our sin. We all were greatly deserving of it. He could have taken us out, but he was patient with us. He could have caused us to be killed in that, you know, some shootout or some craziness. Uh, anything could have happened to us. But God was patient with us, long-suffering toward us. And he, was, he patiently waited and gave us opportunity to come to him. Thank the Lord that we had the privileged opportunity to come to him. And there are so many more that still need to come. And that's why it's so important for us to open our mouths and share the good news and the gospel with others so that they too could have a chance to come. We shouldn't keep this a secret. This is not something to keep a secret. This is good news to be shared amongst all and to tell and let everybody know that, hey, there's opportunity. The door is still open. God is still waiting. He's still patiently with his arms open wide, waiting to forgive your sin and to invite you into everlasting life. This is our chance. This is our opportunity. 
And so while God is patiently waiting, while God is delaying the judgment, while he's preserved and held, holding the, the, the final judgment of the whole world, this is the opportunity for those of us who are still here to make known the gospel of Christ to all those who do not know him. OK, so we have purpose, too. He didn't just leave us here for for, you know, being pretty and and being fancy, you know, and collecting toys and stuff like that. No, he left us here that we might be spokesmen and women for the gospel of him, for the good news, the message that he has, that he has come. He's lived. He's died. He's paid the price for everyone's sin and that he can eradicate that sin and promise and guarantee them everlasting life. So we have to do that in his patience. OK. Because the day is going to come ultimately where there's no more opportunity. And so we want to make sure we're making that message known now. Okay? But he says the day of the Lord will come and it's going to come as a thief in the night. Verse 10. So there's a guarantee here. That Peter says, hey, he's coming. The day of the Lord is coming. Judgment is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. His return is coming. And in fact, watch this. It's going to come as a thief in the night which the heavens, in which the heavens will pass away and with a great noise and the elements will melt with the fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Wow. Here's a good, here's a, here's a plan. Peter says the day the Lord is coming, is coming like a thief in the night. That, that analogy is when you're not expecting it. Okay. Um, it's coming when, when we're not expecting it to come. It's coming that's when thieves come. They come at nighttime when, you, when you're resting, when you're sleeping, when, when you're not paying attention, okay? The Lord's day is coming like that. It's coming quickly, swiftly, in the middle of the time when you might be not alert for it, like a thief in the night. And watch this. And in that day, when it happens, the heavens are going to pass away with a great noise and the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. In other words, this, this earth is going to be destroyed with a fervent and fierce heat, and it will all burn up and melt away. That's the promise of God. That's in the final judgment. It's going to come, the day of the Lord, as he um, talks about it here. He says, therefore, since all these uh, things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you be in holy conduct and godliness? Wow. Now, here's a, here's a, a great teaching moment. Here's a great, powerful uh point of understanding. If this is what ultimately is going to happen to everything in the earth, and guess what? Most people that build their whole life and their whole system of value around this earth and the things that are on it. But watch this. If, all, if you are going, if you're being keenly made aware by God that all of this is going to perish away and burn up and melt away, wherein should you be investing your life, your livelihood, and your, your righteousness. Should my righteousness be invested in the things of this world? Should my energy and my efforts be invested in holding on to this stuff when it's going to burn up and melt away? Or should my life, should I say it that way, should my life be invested in living holy for God because I'm going to be going to a holy place? Okay, I'm going to be removed from a from an earth and and stuff that's going to be burnt up, and I will be transformed or trans um, or, or moved, if you will, uh, to a holy place which is with God. So my energy, my efforts, it really should be focused on the heavenly and not the earthly, because this is all temporary. All of this is going to pass away. All of this is going to be gone. It's going to burn up. Boof. It's going to be gone in smoke and smoke. And imagine for a moment, some of you have probably already had this experience, but imagine for a moment you go away to work, come home that day. And that day you come home, your house caught on fire and burned to the ground. You come home, you got nothing, nothing there. Everything is gone. Imagine for a moment how much investment of your heart and your life is in that house. Now, Imagine it from a, a bigger perspective that in a flash, in a moment, as a thief of the night, the whole earth, everything is gone. How much energy, effort, and passion have you invested in the things of this earth? 
And we got to really conscientiously process that because it changes the way we live in this world. If all of my energies and my efforts are on things that are going to perish, I am wasting energy, effort, and time. But if I'm vested in the kingdom of God and I realize what I have now is temporary, then I can then live with expectation towards a divine, holy, sanctified, righteous kingdom and life with God. I hope this is making sense. Now, let me give you another analogy. I just thought about this one. Um, when sometimes um, ladies, um, they go to the um, salon and they get their uh, toes done. They get their little pedicure. They clean your feet up and do all that stuff. Put, your, put the nail polish on. They put all the little stuff in between your toes. And then they give you these like paper-like slippers. These like, they just, you know, they, they're not, they're temporary, okay? So they're uh, disposable, okay? So my guess is that most people, when they get those little disposable slippers, that they're not trying to make them last for six months to a year, okay? Because they're not going to last. They're not made to last that long. They're only really made enough to get you out of the salon until your feet dry or your toes dry. And then, you know, you take them off and dispose of them if they last that long, okay? Because you go get your toes done and it's raining outside. You go outside with those paper slippers on. Those things are gone. What you, what's your point, Pastor? My point is, it's an analogy to show you you can't invest in temporary things. You can't, you can't hold value to temporary things. We don't hold value to things that we know are going to be disposed. And if we understand that this world that we live in is going to be disposed, it is a disposable world. It is going to burn up and be thrown away. Then I can invest and I can focus on those things that are of more value and those things that are eternal. And that's what Peter is really trying to drive home to us here. Focus on the eternal and not the temporary. Because what the false teachers are trying to challenge is the fact that somehow God is not coming. Judgment is not coming. And it's not going to happen. And so then, therefore, we can invest all of our energy, all of our faith, all of our love, all of our worship in this earthly stuff. And Peter's saying, no, God is coming. He is going to return. He's coming like a thief in the night. Um, he's, he's coming to, to burn up everything that's here. Oh, this whole, this earth is, uh, the, 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 um, the land, the, everything, the heavens, earth, all this is going to pass away. It's going to burn up. And say so that's why he comes back in verse 11. He says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, then what manner of person ought you to be in terms of your holy conduct? In terms of holy conduct, I ought to be a person that's pursuing holy conduct because earthliness is not going to benefit me, you know? Uh, being carnal is not going to benefit me. So he says, looking, unto, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. So here we go. So we ought to be looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. That's where we ought to be. Our focus ought to be on that. Looking forward to and hastening towards that day that he returns. Verse 13 says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. There you have it. So don't invest in this. This is temporary. It's going to pass away. Don't hold too tightly to this world and this stuff. It's going to pass away. We ought to be looking unto the eternal heaven and earth that's coming. That's going to be forever. So let that be the place and the position of our investment and our mindset. I'm moving toward that and not so much toward this. And so here it goes. I'm going to try to help somebody right about here. And so guess what? Even if I lose stuff down here, if I came home and my house was burned to the ground, it's just stuff. It was going to burn down anyway. So that's, that's not important. It's temporal. It's, 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 it's not valuable. It doesn't, ha it doesn't have value. It's a pseudo value. But if I, if I invest in my heavenly kingdom and the heavenly kingdom that, to which I am going to spend my eternity, stay here with me, that's where the value really is. 
And even while I'm here in this earthly realm, living in this, this, this constraining physical carnal body, I still need to have a mind that is heavenly and divine. And I'm, 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 watch this, I'm using my physical body and my physical abilities that I attain and acquire things to invest into the kingdom of God for eternity. Okay? Because you and I know only what we do for Christ will last. Everything else and anything else is just going to burn up. So he says, you know, again here, we're, we're looking and hast for the hastening of the day. And according to the promise, we look for the new heaven and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. So I'm looking for to the day that everybody is righteous because in the new heaven and the new earth, everybody is holy. Everybody is righteous. And so we're pushing and looking forward to that. In fact, I'm, I, watch this, I, I, I want to be living towards that now. And that's what we as Christians, we ought to be, want to be living towards righteousness now. Because guess what? I, and I hate to say it this way, but as he comes as a thief in the night, I'm already practicing to live where I'm going to live. I'm already preparing myself to live in an angelic, heavenly, divine, righteous place. And so when I get there, I'm comfortable, if that makes sense. All right. Now, verse 14 says, therefore, my beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. OK, so if I know God is coming and judgment is coming, he's going to examine me when he comes. He says then, like, as I'm looking forward, OK, to this coming of the Lord, to this judgment day of the Lord, when all this earthly stuff is burnt up. And I'm, I'm living towards righteousness. He says, look, as I'm looking forward to these things, he says, be diligent to be found in him, that is in Christ, in peace. So th here's the message. Seek to be in him, that's first of all, where peace is without spot and blameless. The only way we can, watch this, the only way we can be, oh, how do I say this? without spot or blemish and blameless is we have to be in him and have him <coughs> excuse me live in us watch this as i was doing this study it kind of gave a, a illustration of uh of the examination process of uh clay pots and clay um uh pottery and so what the illustration was is that in these uh, biblical era times, one of the ways in which they would patch or uh, a cracked pot would be that that potter would put a wax type element over and spin it over the, the pot, the bowl, or the pottery, whatever element it was, that was cracked. Now, what the wax would do, would, it would cover the element, and it would fill the crack, and it would be difficult to see. So, let's say you have a bowl, and it's got a crack in it, and every time you put your milk in it, is is milk leaking out. So, you take this wax, put it back on a spin, spinning wheel, and the, 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 the potter takes this wax solution and rubs it around the bowl as the bowl is spinning around. So now he's spinning this wax solution over the bowl to cover the crack so that you, it's like a crack filler, okay? So that your bowl is now not leaking milk anymore. So now let's go say, now you're ready, to, you're gonna sell your bowl and you're selling this bowl as, you know, a perfect bowl in perfect condition. Works great, doesn't leak, doesn't, everything's great about it. So now the process would be that you would take a bowl Somebody who was buying that pottery, they would take it and do what was called the light test, okay? So they'd hold it up to the light because if you just looked at it, you couldn't see it. But if you held it up to the light, then the light would expose the flaws. The light would expose the spots. The light would expose the cracks. Here, here's the imagery, and I love this. This is beautiful. <clears throat> In the day of judgment, every vessel of clay that God has created. Lord, help us here. This is good stuff. It's going to be light tested. It's going to be held up to the perfect light for God himself is light. And it's going to be held up to the perfect light 
and all those things that are cracks and flaws will be exposed. Now, while that, while that vessel, that human being was down here on earth, people may have looked at that vessel from the outside and thought, man, they look good. They got it all together. They're doing right things. They look nice. They act nice, this, that, and the other. But nobody really knows the true character of the vessel until you hold it up to the light. And the judgment of God is a light test for all of us that we will be held up to the light of God and we will be inspected for cracks and flaws and blemishes and spots. And in that day, he says, look, be diligent to be found in him and watch this, and him in you, in peace and without spot and blameless. And watch this. So when we, watch this, when we are in Christ, no matter how broken a vessel we were, no matter how cracked and flawed we were, when we're in him, he doesn't cover us with wax. He covers us in his blood. And in the process of him covering us in his blood, he mends us back together and makes us whole again. And so then when we're held up to the light, test of God. All God sees is a perfect earthen vessel that has been perfected by the blood of the lamb. And all those that are perfected by the blood of the lamb, he will collect and bring on in to his home in glory with him. But all of those that are fractured and with flaws and spots and wrinkles, you will cast those aside because nobody wants a flawed vessel. And so those flawed vessels will be cast into the lake of fire where they will burn for eternity because they are worthless to the perfect king who is looking for perfect vessels. And the only way we can be perfected is we have to be in him. Praise God, somebody. And so we want to be found blameless, without spot, without wrinkle, and perfect in him. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Wow, my God. So all that he went through, all the waiting, all the patience, that's our salvation, okay? All he endured, that's our salvation. As also our beloved brother and Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scripture. So what Peter says, look, Paul talked about the same thing in his writings, how it was necessary for us to be in Christ and for him to be in us. Paul talked about the necessity for us to repent of our sins and place our faith in him. Paul talked about it in the, in the book of Romans and he, he it literally points to that in all the other writings of the Apostle Paul. He says, Paul speaks of these things. And in fact, some of the things Paul speaks about as it relates to our salvation and our eternity, some of them, he says, they're difficult to understand. But the fact that they're difficult to understand, watch this, it, it, gave, it gave opportunity to the false teachers to twist it and to manipulate it. Because as he talks about here, the, the, uh, they twist to their own destruction, okay? They twist it to mean what they want it to mean for their fleshly purpose. They twist it out of, take it out of context, twist it this way, twist it that way. Try to add to a requirement for God, okay? Christ gave his life to redeem us from our sin and he paid the price alone. Now, but there others will take some of that and say, oh, no, what else? He didn't, he didn't, that wasn't all. There was something else that needed to be done. There was more that needed to be added. You had to be a Jew. You had to do this. You had to do that. And this is the twisting that he's talking about. And these are the things that are still happening today. Christ is not enough. You need Christ and. No, you don't need Christ and. You have everything you need in him. He's everything. He is our all. And so there's no need for anything else. But because we can't understand it all. And this is another, this is a conversation I was having as well this week. Young lady says, I, I just don't understand all of this. Well, the fact that you don't understand all of it doesn't make it worthy to throw away. Don't throw it away. You have everything you need. You just don't understand it all. Now, let me help somebody right here. To help in your understanding is beneficial to go to, to Bible study where we study the Bible and to find yourself in places and in studies where you can learn more. And guess what? 
Bible study is not the only place you can learn more. You can learn more in Sunday school and discipleship training classes. You can learn more in your own personal studies of the word. You can take time in your own studies and study the word of God and utilize commentaries and utilize, you know, others that can help you understand the word. God has gifted people. He has, he has vested and called people like such as myself to go and to study in the depths of this word to levels that most average people will never, ever study so that we can help you understand it, so that we can draw out the truth of it, so that we can make it plain and livable for you, so that we can help answer your questions. But guess what? Even in all of that, and even the best education that I can get to understand and learn the word of God, there are still things we're still not going to understand. So there is a point that we do have to come to and say, you know what, we're just not going to understand everything. But the fact that I don't understand everything does not make this Christian faith unworth having. It is all we need to be reconciled to God, to be reunited with God, to be, watch this, corrected in our flaws. It's the only way our flaws can be corrected that will stand up to the light test. Now, you can correct your flaws with that wax element, but it's still going to be exposed when God holds, holds it up to the light test. For he is light. And when you stand before him, all of your flaws will be exposed for those of you who are not in him. But for those of you who are in him, he has paid the price through his son, Jesus Christ, to modify, correct, and, and, and watch this, and repair all of our flaws, fractures, through his blood. Somebody should say amen right about there. So he says, he goes on, he closes everything out um, in verse 17 and 18. This is a short chapter. He says, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with error of the wicked. Okay, Paul says, listen, you know the truth. Since you know these things, you know what Paul has taught. You know the, the, the foundations of scripture and the foundations of faith. You know, since you know those, hold on to those, okay? You've known it all beforehand. Beware, lest you fall from your own steadfastness. Lest you get toppled over by some false teacher or some false belief that comes along that catches you at the, the right time or the wrong time or whatever you're going through and challenges your faith by some worldly opinion of a man, he says, beware, 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 lest you fall from your own stead and that fastness, being led away, watch this, not to the truth, but led away in error, okay? Led away with the error of the wicked who had an intention of leading you away from God. What this draws to my imagination, and you maybe have heard me tell this story before, it draws, it draws to my memory the, and, and, and to my, my, my focus. Those who come and knock on your doors who are Jehovah's Witness and sometimes even Mormons, and they're knocking on your door, and watch this, and literally they are trying to draw you away from the truth. OK, they're trying to draw you away to a a religion that cannot save you. They're trying to draw you away to a wax covering that will be exposed by the light test. They're trying to draw you away to some some fictitious belief that that cannot sustain you, that cannot give you life. Now, here's the deal. In some cases, some of those very people that are knocking on your door have come to Christ themselves at some point in time before and they were drawn away, and now they're knocking on your door trying to draw you away. And, and, and watch this. And for some, some whom they're drawn away are saved, some who they're drawn off to this, this, this wickedness or this era of wickedness, they are not even saved. So they don't even get the benefit of coming to wholeness in Christ. And so I'm try, what I'm trying to say is this is not new. Nothing new under the sun. This thing keeps on going. False teachings, false errors, and belief systems keep on going. All of this stuff that we're hearing about and, 
in uh, the new millennial age uh, typologies and, and all this craziness with the, 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 the um, Trump administration and all the, the lies and the, um, the, the demonic worship and uh, QAnon and all this other thing, all false. And people have, have embraced it as a religion, embraced it as some belief system. And they followed it, and, 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 and people just, it's just wickedness. It's all wickedness and deceit to draw people away. And it has done that in many cases. But Peter says, beware, lest you be drawn away from your steadfastness. But here's the op opposition of it. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's, at the end of the day, that's what's most important. What's most important for you as a Christian What's most important for me as a child of God is that I grow in the grace. Watch this. Why grace? Because I was not, I'm, I was not entitled to be a child of God. But by grace, I've become a child of God. And then after I became a child of God, he's also given me grace to be able to learn about him. He has extended you grace. You've got grace. This is grace right now. The fact that we've gone through a year of pandemic and, and you were able to view me and have Bible study presented right in your living room, right in your car, right in your home, right on your computer. This is grace that God has given you grace to be able to tune in on Wednesday night at 7.05 or when other time that you could, it was convenient for you to be able to tune into Bible study so you can learn about God. That's grace. That's grace given to give us opportunity to grow. Grace that was given to us even before the pandemic. Grace that God provided people who knew the word of God, who studied the word of God, who gave their lives to the teaching of the word of God, to people like myself who are, who are intentional about making sure that the word of God can be taught clearly so people can grab it, understand it, live it, fulfill it, walk in it and not just shooting stuff over people's head to try to you know impress them or to try to make myself to seem greater than I am when I'm 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 just a humble servant trying to do what God's called me to do but that's grace it's grace that God has provided that for you it's grace that God provided it for me it's grace to have institutions of learning bible colleges that we can attend scholarships that we, when we can't afford scholarships that perhaps we can get into um, you know, all kinds, there's grace. So we've been afforded multitudes of grace to be able to grow in the knowledge of our Lord. It's grace that you can go onto the internet and you have free Bible software. That's grace. I mean, there are, there are Bible softwares out there online that are completely free. Don't cost you a penny. But back in the day before all this was available, we had to buy those things. You had to buy those books. You had to buy all that documentation and all the information. Now this stuff is free. Look, at that's the grace of God that's being provided that gives us opportunity to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Finally, as Peter closes everything out with his doxology, he says, to him, that is to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. In other words, as Peter closes out, all of the glory belongs to God. And so as we close out this third chapter, this book, obviously, of Peter that he deals with so powerfully of purging false teachers, we got a chance to see tonight the confidence that we can have in Christ's return even though it might be an issue of challenge by false teachers to say he's not coming. So we have confidence. As children of God, we have confidence that he is coming. We have confidence that when he comes, he will judge. And watch this. And confidence that he will know the difference between a fake and a real whole vessel. He'll know the vessels that have been waxed over and he'll know the vessels that have been washed in the blood because they gotta stand up to the light test. Amen. Praise God. Well, that's my Bible study for tonight. I hope you guys learned something, gleaned something from it. Uh, we'll be back uh, on next week, I believe it is. Yeah, next week we'll be back uh, for uh, a qu quick quiz on uh, first, uh, Second Peter and then move into 1 John. We've got 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and then we're into Revelation. 
So hopefully by, well, we don't have Bible study in July. So hopefully by August, we'll be starting off with Revelation and study in Revelation. Something like that. We'll see how the, how, the, how the chips fall. But nevertheless, we're moving ourselves right along here and uh, trying to learn and glean as much as we possibly can uh, from, the, from the Word of God and, and hopefully it's being beneficial to you. So um, I want you guys to have a great weekend. Holiday weekend's coming up, uh, the Memorial Day weekend, and I want you guys to be safe. Uh, you know, please, 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 for those of you who have not yet uh, been vaccinated, uh, you know, don't don't think that you can just run around without your mask. You still need to be having your mask on, you know, and so wear your mask. Uh, for those of you who are traveling, be safe. Uh, I know in the airports and all the places like that that you travel, you got to wear your mask and, and do that type of thing. And they're going to be packing you right on top of each other. No social distancing in the planes. They're going to be getting all the money they can get off the planes and trains and buses and stuff like that. So just, you know, be safe, wash your hands, um, do your hygiene things, but be safe. Even if you have been vaccinated, you know, still be safe, be respectful of other people and behave by the rules and guidelines. And as you're cooking and doing your holiday uh, things like that, please, please, please be safe. Um, if you're not comfortable with doing things, hey, leave it over to somebody who can, amen, or, or is in terms of that. We don't want you burning down the house or, you know, being, um, you know, a victim of, of, of uh, you know, bad cooking, <laughs> uh, that type of thing. I also say this, I say it in, 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 in just, but I also, because it happens all the time. Um, this the Weekends and holidays like that is oftentimes times when people have a tendency to eat things that they know they're not supposed to eat in excess, okay? So you may already know that you're not supposed to have the little pork or beef or whatever it is. And then, of course, it's, it's the weekend, it's the holiday, and you didn't barbecue, somebody didn't barbecue all these pork ribs and you're trying to eat them all. Next thing you know, you're in the hospital. Your blood pressure is shot up and all that kind of thing. Please, please, please eat safe too, okay? Uh, everything in moderation is what I always say, okay? Balance it out. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Don't overgo on anything, uh, but be safe and eat safe. And, you know, cook safe. Have a great, great holiday weekend. Look to see you on Sunday for those of you who are coming. Uh, Ryan Richardson, our youth director, is going to be licensed to ministry. You're welcome to come. We do not have an RSVP. Uh, so you can just come on at our 8 o'clock service and we get a chance to encourage him as he becomes our youth minister uh, as he's being licensed to the gospel ministry. So that'll be an 8 a.m. service this coming Sunday. We'd love to see you there. And I'm sure he would be highly encouraged to have his Kettering family there supporting him uh, on Sunday morning as he takes this next step in the calling of his life towards being licensed to the gospel. Let's look to the Lord in prayer as we close out for tonight. Father in heaven, we love you. We praise you and we thank you for everything you've done and for this night and for the study of the word. We're grateful tonight. Lord, for everyone under the sound of my voice, I pray for grace in their families. I pray for peace in their heart and in their lives. I pray eternal God that you would cover them with your hedge of protection, that you would guide them safely as they may have opportunity and a chance to travel, that you would allow their travel to be safe, that you would allow their fellowships uh, and their time of rest to be beneficial and, and, and a blessing. I pray that those, Lord God, even as they travel and go to various places and points of destination, they come back home and they'll be safe, uh, free of the virus and free of any uh, dangers that may have been uh, targeted their way. I pray, Lord God, even for those who are depressed and suppressed, those that are just in need of encouragement, I pray, Lord God, that you would in somehow, some way, some amazing touch of your grace, encourage them to let them know you love them and you care. Father, be a healer, be a, be a sustainer, be a blessing to your people that they might be a blessing to others. Now, I thank you for all that you've done and all you're going to do. It's in Jesus' precious and powerful name I pray and I thank you. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you all. Again, thank you for hanging out with us on Wednesday. See you next time.